Okay, Mark. Hey. Mm. Good to see you. It feels like it's been a while. Tag. And hello, Ray. All right, we already have a bunch of people here. So welcome everyone, hope you can hear me okay. So as we're about to get started, uh, feel free to put on the Zoom chat where you are logging in from, so where you are, and if you have ever played any musical instrument or a sport. The reason for that question will become very obvious in a second. So where are you calling from and any experience with music or sports? Hey, Tony. Hi, everyone. Great. Jiu-Jitsu. Awesome. All right. Bodybuilding, softball, piano. Excellent. Cool. Guitar, violin, dance. Excellent. Wow. Quite a diverse experience. Yeah. Wow. If you like it. We have more than the whole band here. We have all circus <laughs> here. An international uh, <laughs> band and circus and athletic department. Love it. Well, Wonderful. Everyone. Puerto Rico, Egypt, Morocco, wow. Brux, the United States, Dubai. Very nice. Turkey, Canada. How about that? Wow. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Nigeria. And Westchester. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Westchester? Well, there's two of them. There's Pennsylvania and New York. Oh, oh maybe both hey. then. <laughs> and there's also Paris, Texas, if you want yes. to. <laughs> All Ghana, right. Why don't we jump in? There's so many people already here. This is Let's really exciting. It. All right. Why don't we jump in then? Let me share my screen here. And All right. Tony, can you see that? Yes. Looks great. Okay. All right. So welcome everyone to this exciting webinar on deliberate practice in rational emotive behavior therapy. My name is Alex Fash. I am with my always trusting colleague, Tony Rumanair. We are with the Sentio Marriage and Family Therapy Program, and we are very, very happy to be with our guest experts here, Mark Dergensen and Raymond Giuseppe. Thank you both for being here. They are, of course, experts in REBT. And I cannot not say this. When I was a teenager, I was in psychoanalysis and my, I drove my psychoanalyst crazy because I was benefiting more from REBT self-help books uh -oh. than the psychoanalysis. So thank you by extension, Ray and Mark, for all you do. <laughs> <laughs> in REBT. So let's get started. So uh, Mark, I'll just do a quick presentation here on our guest experts for today. So Mark is a professor of psychology at St. John's University and a core member of the school psychology programs. And he's a child and family service coordinator at the Albert Ellis Institute for Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy in Manhattan. And Raymond is professor of psychology and chair of the Institutional Review Board at St. John's College of Liberal, Liberal Arts and Sciences. He has promoted the recognition of anger as a form of psychopathology and studies the diagnosis, assessment, and treatment of anger problems. And I could go on and on, but I just want to welcome you both. Thank you. Thank you. Exciting opportunity. So... Yeah, uh, Tony, you want to take it away here? Yes. Um, Alex and I are with the Ascentio Marriage and Family Therapy Program in California, and we are doing enrollment. So if you know anyone interested in training to become a therapist uh, using Deliver Practice, uh, you can send them our way at the website on the link. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Tony. All right. So let's jump into the good stuff. Uh because we get excited easily, I could go on and on and Tony and Ray and Mark about the world practice. So we're going to force ourselves to give a one slide intro <laughs> to what the world practice is and why it's important. And then we'll jump straight into today's topic. So we want to make a distinction between conceptual learning and procedural learning. Okay. Conceptual learning be being all sorts of learning that you do through reflection. For example, learning about psychotherapy theories such as REBT through reading REBT books, going to REBT lectures, uh, talking with peers, watching experts uh, on video doing real clinical sessions, 
all that is great. All that is incredibly important to become an expert therapist or really in most fields uh, to become an expert. But there's a different kind of learning and a different kind of knowledge called procedural learning or procedural knowledge. What we could say is learning by doing. Right? So you have that picture there of the piano, for example. Let's imagine you, you want to become an expert pianist. As you all know, it would not be enough to read books about the piano. You would actually have to play the piano and get immediate feedback so that you can practice over and over and get better over time. And we know that this is true for a lot of fields. If you want to be an expert sportsmanship uh, in sports, in uh, being a surgeon, in music, in chess, and we will argue in psychotherapy, conceptual learning is not enough meaning just reading about psychotherapy is not enough to be an expert clinician. But as you might realize, most of our training resources in our field are conceptual learning resources. So if you look at your graduate program experience, et cetera, most of it has to do with conceptual teaching or conceptual learning. So we're trying to fill in a important gap here and trying to promote resources for procedural learning meaning helping people learn the skills of um, of psychotherapy for actual practice or deliberate practice, we should say. And that leads to today's topic. So Tony and I have been editing this book series for the American Psychological Association, this very beautifully rainbow-colored uh, series. And one such book in the series is on deliberate practice in rational emotive behavior therapy. Each of these books contains 10 to 12 skill-building exercises that you can use to practice very specific skills and master crucial skills in each of these models, be it REBT, uh, CBT, Emotion Focus Therapy, etc. And... Mark, Raymond, and their co-author, Christine Doyle, have done a wonderful, difficult job in being able to create 12 skill-building exercises so that people interested in REBT don't just read about REBT, but actually practice the skills to get it in their bones. All right, that's my rant, so we can get to the good stuff. So in this slide, you will see the 12 deliberate practice exercises or skill-building exercises in this book by Mark, Raymond, and Christine on rational emotive behavior therapy. So the book is divided into these 12 exercises, and you'll notice that there's this green, yellow, and red here on the left. What that indicates is that it's basically the more beginner exercises, intermediate level exercises, and advanced level exercises. And I'll start by asking Mark and Ray, first of all, why is deliberate practice relevant for rational emotive behavior therapy or to learn REBT? So Alex, I would say you got probably got the idea of deliberate practice from Albert Ellis and REBT, that we are <laughs> probably one of the first group of people to do this. Back in 1975, after I got my PhD and I did a postdoctoral fellowship with that Ellis, we used to run these training programs, which we still do. And half of the time was conceptual learning, but the other half of the time was practice. You had to do it. We would always have people pair up into peer counseling duos. And we would say, if Mark and I were on the same team, I would present the clinical problem to Mark and he would do therapy on me. Then we'd reverse roles and I would be the, you know, the client and deal with his problems. And we would instruct people, this is what we want you to focus on. You don't do an intake. You don't do a diagnosis. You don't have to cure the client. Just focus on these skills. Let's get the ABCs. Let's, uh, and we would do that. And we would do that for a five-day practicum. And now we do it. So the, the 12 exercises that we have gotten here probably were developed in about 40 years of training in REBT, where we have had people do that. And what we recognized is people could very often know the conceptual material and flub the practice part. They were unable to put it into practice and that after rehearsal, they would do better. We also realized that the sooner we gave them feedback, the better off they did. Sometimes in the, when we first started to do this, we would give them feedback after a little bit more time and uh, that was nice. We also learned that people learn to do a better job by observing their peers getting feedback. 
say, oh, gee, Mark made that mistake. I don't want to do that. Let me do it a little bit different. And then it would go around and I'd make a mistake. And Tony might say, oh, no, I see that right. And so that we have been doing deliberate practice probably for a good 40 years. And that's where those 12 skills come from. And I would also add that probably the most influential thing that made me and my supervision school skills is I was a high school football coach. Okay. And it was really important to do exercises over and over again, you know, have a fumble recover exercise, a pulling guard blocking exercise. And what I learned as a football coach is that people lose games because of the basic skills. They don't block and tackle and pass off well. It's not the fancy, complicated things that lose games. It's the basic skills. So being a football coach, I think, made me a natural for deliberate practice in REBT training. One thing, Alex, I would add, and thanks, for I'm going to stick with the football for a minute. Some football teams, the coaches will review video with their players a week later and will then say, oh, look, you know, Alex, you didn't do this right, change this. And that's and it's also one of the training models in psychotherapy. People will see clients and then will get feedback during supervision a week later about, oh, next time, Alex, do this. Or next time, Tony, try to do that. Where I think coaching and then deliberate practice is apl applicable in psychotherapy and more specifically in our IPT is it's in the moment. You're not waiting a week later to yeah. teach these skills. You're teaching them in the moment. So, Ray, if you're teaching somebody how to tackle, you're back on the field saying, okay, just now you tackled this way. Now I want you to get into this stance. And now I want you to tackle. Same thing within, and we'll demonstrate this in a little bit, but same thing within our ABT and deliberate practice is getting them to do the skill, give immediate feedback on the skill, and then getting them to do the skill again subsequent to that as well. So it might, might think, in a way, psychotherapy is a motor skill, not an intellectual skill. Mm. If you don't do it and get feedback and practice it again, you may know the theory and not really do it well. And we've seen that a lot. I've had lots of people call me up and say, I can skip, I should get that advanced certificate in REBT because I've read every book and I've done going to lots of lectures but then i say give me a recording or show me a session and they don't do so well right so they are very separate entities alex can you go back to the 12 skills again yeah for, a minute? for sure let's do it so one of the other things that ray said a few minutes ago over the years of the training at the albert ellis institute is we would teach these different skills um and over a course of a four-day training, it is scaffolding. It is sequential in nature. So the first day of a training, in addition to the conceptual learning, they might get procedural learning on maybe the first three, four, or five exercises you see up here. And the second day, more conceptual learning, followed by these skills, but also them practicing skills six, seven, eight, and nine. And so the deliberate practice component has been part of the RBT training model for, as Ray said, over 40 years at this point. Um, and, and for us, it was a natural fit because it's been done already. But now the model that, that we're going to show or demonstrate in a little bit allows people to move from, you know, competency to expertise. To Love it. And one, one of our challenges initially was we couldn't fit in only 12 skills. We had many more skills we wanted to demonstrate. Um, but the structure of the book forced us to think about what are the essential skills and in what order do we see these skills being demonstrated? Right, because we and, have developed and, grading scales for these skills that we've used in our REBT training. And we have 12 more maybe for an advanced book that we could do because we have the different skills that people can use to become a little bit more sophisticated. Okay. And, and one of the things that was fun for us in writing this book is within each of these exercises, we would have varying levels of challenges for clients, um, for training, so I'm trying to say. That in terms of some of the skills are straightforward. You know, the client tells you what emotion that they're feeling and what their rational belief is. But we know clients don't always make things easy on us. And so we also had a number of uh, subsets within the exercises to really challenge people more to demonstrate not just competency, but expertise in these skills as well. 
And I should just say, I appreciate very much, Mark, Ray, and Christine, your unconditional other acceptance for <laughs> and uh, high frustration tolerance for us forcing you to do only 12 skills. I know that was hard, but uh, maybe we helped you with uh, letting go of the demand, the command that it had to be more skills, which is great. So this leads to the question, how did you choose these 12 particular skills in that case, given so many were possible? Well, I think one of the important issues is the th basic therapeutic alliance. REBT and all other, I think, cognitive behavior therapists do build on the therapeutic alliance. And Al Ellis really knew the people who wrote about this idea of common factors and sort of specifically said, you have to have agreement on the goals and agreement on the tasks. So, you know, if I try to dispute your irrational belief that's connected to your anxiety, but you haven't agreed to change your anxiety, why am I doing this? It doesn't provide a motivation. And so these first um, couple of skills are teaching you about the BC connection and about what we're gonna do in REBT, but also teaching you about some agreement on the goals. The, the first two skills really are some of the issues that make REBT distinctive from other sessions. So REBT was one of the first therapies to develop this ABC model, activating event or stimuli, B for beliefs and C for emotional and behavioral consequences. And that's been part of the uh, REBT model since the 1950s. Also, REBT is different from many other therapies in making a distinction between adaptive negative emotions and maladaptive negative emotions. So if a bad activating event occurs and I feel a disturbed negative emotion, no matter how rational I am, I'm going to feel some negative emotion and it's going to be a adaptive negative emotion. We want to get rid of the maladaptive. And many people try to get rid of any emotion, which is really, I think, kind of impossible and really hard to sell to clients. So we want to change your disturbed anxiety to some kind of apprehension or concern that's going to keep you noticing what's going on, but isn't going to interfere. So I think that those additional skills were really kind of important um, yeah. for REBT. Well, one of the other things, Alex, in response to your question too, yeah, as Ray said this before, we had many more skills than these, these 12 exercises. We did survey colleagues who we consider to be experts in REBT, like, hey, what are the skills you teach the most? What do you see as the essential components of REBT? And then also Ray and I using one of our doctoral students, Dr. Rebecca Wade's dissertation. Rebecca surveyed clinicians uh, internationally, surveyed clinicians about their use of REBT and which ones they found to be most helpful. And so we use that information to guide us in terms of choosing which skills. Like if you look at exercises eight through 10, those are three examples of how to dispute or challenge irrational beliefs. There are many more ways to do that, but those are the more common ones that we see used, as well as the ones we find have the greatest kind of impact with clients too. Um, but there are others, and we reference them in the book too. But there are other approaches, and so these, you know, these are the beginning skills that we think not only a competent but an expert or IBT clinician can and should be able to demonstrate. Too. That's I think a preference. One of the other key differences is um, skill number, exercise number four. You know, REBT doesn't say that all cognitions are equally effective or in, in causing disturbed emotion. It really focuses on certain cognitions. And so if you ask me, you know, before this webinar saying, oh, I might make a mistake. Oh, what if I do something stupid? What if my computer doesn't work? And those are sort of the negative automatic thoughts that I'm predicting may happen. Some people will call them negative automatic thoughts. We will call them inferences, but they're not the focus of REBT. The focus of REBT are more evaluative and empirical. You know, I should never make a mistake. I better be thought of positively by people in the audience. You know, if I make a mistake, I'm an idiot and a, and a buffoon. Those irrational beliefs are separate from the inferences. And sometimes people will get the difference but they don't know how to ask the question. When a client gives them a negative automatic thought or an inference, and I say, oh, what do I say to get to the 
more evaluative empirical uh, thought that they might be having. And so that exercise becomes really critical to distinguish doing REBT from more generic forms of cognitive behavior therapy. And, and related, like yeah, I'm looking at exercise six in terms of prioritizing which belief. One of the things I see at our training clinic is the moment students or trainees hear anything that sounds like an irrational belief, they jump on it. They jump on it right away and they try to dispute that belief. But that may not be the real one that's creating the emotional and behavioral disturbance for individuals. And so when, when we process it with our students and we then have them practice, hey, let's look for which other rational beliefs may be there and how do we then target those for change? And so I think when this goes back to the conceptual learning, yeah, someone could identify a should pretty quickly, but maybe it's not the should that's causing the disturbance. Maybe it's the catastrophizing or awfulizing they have, or the ratings of words or the frustration and tolerance. So we, as part of the training, we thought it important to help people figure out, don't just listen for the belief and jump on it, but how do you figure out which one makes the most sense to target for change? The analogy I use with my trainees very often is, a lot of irrational beliefs might be on the bus. One of them is driving the bus. So we have to help them figure out which one makes the most sense to go about targeting for change. Right. And the one that may be driving it may not necessarily be the one they endorse the most or they think the most. It may be one that sort of grabs them and is most strongly associated to their disturbed emotion. They know that we don't. And if we don't teach the therapist how to ask, people can challenge the wrong belief, which really is not good for the therapeutic alliance. Challenging the wrong thing in REBT or cognitive therapy really, I think, is one of the biggest um, issues to cause an alliance structure with clients. One, one of the other last things for me, tell Alex, for this, is what I, what I like, and I remember the moment that Ray, Christy, and I agreed upon this, for skills eight through 10, in those examples, the client prompt is the thing. So it's, a, it's showing how can you challenge or dispute an irrational belief from a functional perspective, from an empirical perspective, and, and from a semantic perspective. And so that the readers would then get to see there's more than one way to challenge this belief, and they could then compare and contrast and find which ones work for you. But if you're only really good at the empirical dispute, and your client is really good at pushing back on that. Well, by doing the trainings, you'll have functional and semantic already set to go in terms of how to challenge those beliefs and dispute those beliefs. So I like that we structured it that way to allow for people to see that more than one way to dispute a belief. And these are cognitive disputes and we have more cognitive disputes, but you also might have some behavioral disputes and you might have some emotional disputes and probably some imagery exercises. So you might say, let's imagine that you're in the same activating event and you imagine yourself feeling this disturbed emotion. Can you imagine a new, more adaptive emotional uh, reaction that you can have so that there are a lot of them we had to limit. You know, these guys are tough. Tony and Alex are tough, making us limit them. That was sort of our biggest debate here, like, you know, limiting it to 12. But but I understand that because you can't learn everything at once. It takes a while to, you know, put things in, in small pieces so you can do them. One of my favorite pieces of music is, you know, variations on a theme by Paganini. But if you don't know the Paganini concerto, you're not going to be able to do the variations. You can't add little, you know, things that make something better if you don't know the basic skills. And I think that's really what we're trying to do here is get the basic skills that other things may be drawn on and allow you to do some more creative things. So I think I think we would say, and uh, interested in Tony and Alex, you're is that your creative interventions may come more after you have the basic skills. And it's if you just do some creative skill, you don't really know if it's related to some of the basic things that work and it comes out of nowhere and the clients don't know where it's coming from.
that's sort of, I think, one of the issues there. Yeah. And to your point, Ray, I love your comment before that most clinical mistakes, if you want to call them that way, tend to be not getting the basics right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so it's great that people, I, I would imagine that in most supervision sessions, REBT supervision sessions, you go back to a variation of some of these skills most often. Yes. In other words, it's, it tends to be a third agreement on the goals, agreement on the tasks, explaining the BC connection, making the distinction between a disturbed emotion and a non-disturbed emotion, validating that the client's going to have a non-disturbed emotion afterwards, distinguishing between the irrational belief and the surface negative automatic thoughts. Those are the basics. And those were most of the mistakes get made. Um, even if people, are, and, and I think they often get made because people are, are moving too quickly. And one of the things about deliberate practice is it sort of gets you to slow down and do the things until they're almost rote and automatic. So yeah. the, and, and that's really what you want to do in therapy is you want the client to become automatically going to challenge their irrational belief and think rational thoughts. So, uh, yeah, we want to get it as concrete and and orderly as we can. So we want to practice what we preach and we want to show and not just tell. So one idea we had was to focus on one of these exercises and not just show an example, but invite attendees to try out the skill here on the Zoom chat. And we have decided to focus on exercise seven, I should say a classic in RBT, that of teaching the belief consequence connection. And the way all of our door practice exercises work is the offers really try to deconstruct the skill into actionable principles, what we call skill criteria. So these numbered statements you see up here are really the deconstruction of what it means to teach the belief consequence connection in this case. So I'll just read here the, the, the principles, the skill criteria. So for the therapist to do the skill of teaching the BC connection, the therapist should first make a statement that connects the client's irrational belief with its consequence, and then ask a question that checks the client's understanding of the BC connection. And before I give the example, Mark, Ray, any note you want to give on the importance of the skill? Yeah, no, I, I, and that's, I'm glad we chose this one. Yeah, I'm going to work backwards. The second thing I think is so important though, to check the client's understanding. I think we all have clients at different points who could be like bobblehead. They just agree with us that but if they don't understand when you're trying to point out that their irrational belief is leading to this emotional or behavioral consequence, and you just move on to challenging that belief, that's going to confuse them. It's not going to lead to any kind of good clinical change because they're not actually sure what you're doing. So we do need to spend some time teaching this skill, but also then checking that they understand the importance of why it's the way they think that's leading to this emotional behavioral response, not the behavior of another. And so like in the example we have here, not the behavior of the brother, but rather what you are thinking about the brother's behavior, which is the core of REBT, um, and how those thoughts lead to that maladaptive negative emotion, in this case, anger, and behavior avoidance, like not speaking with the sibling too. And so, so we want to. We chose this skill because we thought everything else that follows it right. isn't going to make sense unless we're actively teaching people how to connect their irrational belief with their unhealthy, negative emotional and behavioral consequences. And another way to look at this is this is the basic principle of Stoic philosophy. REBT is definitely based on Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, Seneca, and the Stoic philosophers. And that's their basic point. And lots of people remember the famous quote by Epictetus. You know, people are not disturbed by things, but the things they take about. But they don't know how to say that to a client. And they don't know how to Socratically get the client to see the connection between those things, even though they can quote Shakespeare, like things are neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. That doesn't mean they can do the interview. 
So. Great. So let's see how it actually looks like then in session. So we have an example here. And the way, again, this works in the world practice is we don't go off into a free form role play where one person plays a client, another person plays a therapist, and they just go on and on talking, which is what most people think about when they think of role plays in the context of clinical training. In the little practice, we single out a single scripted client statement to be read over and over, and the person role-playing the therapist improvises a response based on these skill criteria, right, on these number principles we discussed before. So in this case, let's imagine that the client angrily says, I was so angry the other day as my brother had me go to pick him up at the airport, and he never told me he took another flight. Now I'm not talking to him. I can't stand that he does this. Therapist could fulfill the skill criteria by responding. It sounds like when you think, I can't stand that he does this, it leads you to get so angry. And now you are not even speaking to your brother. Is that correct? So this fulfills skill criteria one. The therapist making a statement that connects the client's irrational belief with its consequence. Second, therapist says, does that connection of your thoughts to your feelings of anger make sense to you? And that fulfills skill criteria too. Therapist asking a question that checks the client's understanding of the BC connection. And I just want to highlight here, there are of course many different words the therapist could use to fulfill these skill criteria, right? There's many different ways, and I'm sure Mark, Raymond, Al, Alice have different styles in teaching the BC connection, but the important thing is doing it in a way that fulfills these two criteria. Yep. Anything you'd add to that, Mark or Ray? Yeah, so Alex, what, what I like to you, you did, hi highlight this too. Right, everyone's language is different, and you have to find language that works for you as a clinician, but probably more importantly, it also works for your clients to understand this thing too. What we, we do, and we have this throughout, is a lot of suppositional language. So as an example here, it sounds like, is very different than, well, here's what you're doing. Like, that's very, very direct. And so it sounds like offers it up as a hypothesis, and you're using their phrase or their words, here, I can't stand it. And then, as Tony, as Alex pointed out, connecting it to both the emotional anger, as well as the behavioral, not speaking to the brother. So you offer it up and then ask, is that correct? Now, many times it might be. There may also be, and this goes to one of our earlier skills, it could be an implied demand there. I can't stand that he does this and he shouldn't do this. You're going off of the language that the client says. But if the client said, yeah, I don't know if I can't stand it, I think it's awful that he does this, or he shouldn't do this though, then clinically you would end up challenging that. Belief. But we'll go with directly what the client said here. And then again, as, as Alex said, and as we had said earlier, checking to make sure they understand that the way they're thinking leads to their feelings and their behaviors. I would add that the, this exercise really teaches two things. We kind of like double up. It's teaching the connection between the thought and the emotion behavioral consequence, but it's also reflective. When the therapist says that, therapist is communicating to the client that they understand what happened, they understand what they're upset about, and they understand what they're thinking about. So you could say, is this an REBT skill or is this a common factors reflection skill? It really is both. And I think at times uh, we, we didn't create it this way, but we recognize that sometimes our skills are serving more than one purpose. They're teaching an REBT skill and they're reflecting a common factor of psychotherapy skill. So I always love that you connect, Ray, the specific with the common factors. Yeah. So, all right. So uh, as we have said, we want to also practice what we preach. So instead of us just yakking away, which we could joyfully, let's give people a chance to actually try out the skill. So our invitation to everyone here attending is that you try writing a therapist response to a new client statement that you can see on the screen now. So let's imagine that the client says, I was very depressed that I wasn't invited to my supposed friend's wedding. I'm a loser and so stupid for thinking anyone would care about me like that. 
I don't even reach out to anyone from my friend group and uh, now. So as you mentioned, client says this, for all those who want to join, try writing on the Zoom chat a therapist response that would fulfill these two skill criteria. And we'll give everyone a minute to try writing a response and then Mark and Ray can give some feedback. Sure. Let's wait a minute. And and I'll uh, Mark and Ray, I'll read these as they uh, as they appear. Okay. Here, here's the first one, the one from Melody. It sounds like you feel stupid and depressed because you were not invited to your friend's wedding. So Melody, I, I like that. So the first part, and this is one of our others, you said you feel stupid and depressed. I would say that feelings are more emotions and the depressed falls into that, but feeling stupid, which we use that in language all, all the time, it felt stupid. I would say that's more of a thought and that's more of the irrational belief. So while I like what you did, Melanie, in terms of summarizing, I thought that was good. It might be more effective to say, so when you're thinking, I'm a loser and stupid because I didn't get invited to your friend's wedding, you end up feeling depressed. So the first part I would say, and Melanie, I liked it, is I would just focus on what the beliefs are and then connect the belief, I'm a loser, I'm stupid, and connect those to the feeling of depression and then not talking to anybody in the friend as well. But I like that. that was a good start. Here, can I uh, read another one? Yeah. Uh, Ciara said, I heard you say that you're sad because someone you care about left you out of an important life event. I think I, I like that. And what, what she's done is identified the emotion, I feel sad, and identified the inference that they left her out. But there's a there's a missing piece of what you're thinking thinking about you. Mm. So in other words, in, in that this client is thinking that there's something wrong with them, that they were not invited. And that is a critical part. So you're feeling sad when you think that there's something wrong with you that your client, your friend didn't invite you. Now, can you see the relationship between that feeling and that evaluation? Right. And, and I like that. And one thing I thought about too in hearing that, so the client used the word depressed. And I might actually use their language too. Like sad may actually, depending, sad may be a healthy response to this. Disappointment, sadness, those might be healthy responses. This person was important to me. They didn't invite me. I feel sad. But the client said, very depressed. And, and while I understand we want to mix up the language at different points, I try to stick with using the words the, when possible, using the words the clients say to truly reflect their emotional experience too. And I think Ray's point about the belief is really key. Ray, I, I would just like to highlight something here, which is what we're seeing is the level of precise feedback that Mark and Ray are providing to everyone. While no one has had like a bad response, right? Uh, Mark and Ray are providing kind of fine tuning that can really help improve the effectiveness yeah. of your responses. I think that's really right, Tony. The pr precision in language is really important in psychotherapy because you don't want to reflect an emotion that they didn't experience. You don't want to go beyond the thoughts that they were having. You know, that might be part of a later skill. You might say, well, could it be that you were also thinking, but that's a separate skill than just here, right? Yeah. So precision in language may be an important meta skill that we're going to have to teach at some point. And going back to Ray's example from earlier about being a football coach, you know, sometimes tackles work, even if they're not the best tackles. We just want to be happy to be able to tackle somebody better. And <laughs> But as Tony said, all these examples that I'm seeing pop up, they're really solid and they probably will work, but we want to be a little more specific, especially as it relates to RABT, be a little more specific in building this skill to the point when we do it, it becomes, as Ray said earlier, pretty much automatic for the client to do it as well. Right. Great. Let's try another one. 
Yeah, I'm just sharing here because I believe Mark, you wanted also to to share an example therapist response that could be read. So yeah. So one example is a therapist could say, in RBT, we want to look at how our unhealthy or irrational beliefs create unhealthy emotions and behaviors. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you are thinking I'm a loser. And that makes you feel very depressed and disconnected from your friend group. Is that right? Do you understand how thinking that way will lead to those unhealthy negative emotions and behaviors? Right. So this is one example. And I should also point out in the book that uh, the Dolor Practice in REBT book, you will find that for every client's statement, there is also an example therapist response written by uh, Ray uh, and uh, Mark and Christine, so that those that don't know how to answer, they have a, a statement there that they can model from, right? And even Alex, if you just look at that set, that sample response, like that, that's part of the sentence. But it sounds like you were thinking. So it sounds like is that suppositional, hypothesis-driven uh, uh, presentation. If you are thinking, I'm a loser. That's the irrational belief, and that makes you the, the B C connection that makes you feel depressed and disconnected from your friends. So we're, we're really trying to be concrete in how we go about doing this. One of the last things about this one, but also about the prior one, Ray mentioned you know, the common factors. Yeah, would it be good to validate what the client's experiencing, like a healthy validation? It sounds like you know, I, I would probably feel disappointed or sad if a friend did this to me, or I'd be frustrated at my brother if he asked me to pick him up at the airport. That can validate like a healthy emotion. And we had those in here initially. Those are part of the common skills, the common factors we're just talking about. But we want to be more economical in terms of how we presented the specific REBT skills so people can see exactly what we're looking for rather than all these other factors, which we're assuming people have and assuming people will develop rather than having all these other factors there too. Yeah. Right. Let's try Let's try a, a different client statement. And again, same challenge for all those of you who are attending. So let's imagine that client says, I forgot to call my mother on her birthday and feel so guilty. Who knows how many more she will have? I should have called. I, I am such a bad person. And now I just ordered an expensive makeup gift that I cannot afford. So same challenge, try writing a response that fulfills the skill criteria for this new client statement. No takers? Is this a hard one? Oh, it's, it's interesting. Oh, there, there we depression, go. Everybody jumped in with depression. Guilt, <laughs> we, Ray and I, Ray and I talked about guilt is one of the more challenging emotions. Yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, here we that... are. Let, let me read this. So when you think you are a bad person, you feel guilty and buy gifts you cannot afford. Would you agree with that? See, I, I like that. So when you think you're a bad person, I believe, Tony, it was a think or belief? Uh, when you think. Yeah. Okay. So when you think you're a bad person, you then feel guilty and buy things you can't afford. I like that. So yes. there's there's two parts to this if you look at. I am such a bad person, which is what the client said to me. But even the sentence right before, I should have called. Like so there's two irrational beliefs there. There's the should, I should have called. And then the evaluation, there's the demand, I should have called. And then the evaluation that I'm a bad person because I did. And so in conceptualizing and responding to it, you might want to point out to them that there might be a couple of different beliefs they have there. I might argue the should the, might be the more dominant, but you want to see which of the two creates the most amount of guilt for the client as well. The other good thing about that comment is that those two beliefs were linked to a dysfunctional disturbed emotion and a negative dysfunctional behavior. You know, boy, I screwed up and now I'm going to be in debt and because <laughs> I, I, I went overboard. So that very often the irrational beliefs lead to an affect 
that's disturbed and a dysfunctional behavior. So that was really good that you got both of those in there. Great. Here's another. Um, I hear that you feel guilty and that led you to overcompensate. Is that right? Well, that's making a connection between the emotion and the behavior. I overcompensated my guilt. Then let me, not the belief that led to the guilt. So the belief that led to the guilt, that's still a good thing to point out. And it's still a good common factor statement to get people. I understand that when you're depressed, you do things that aren't so helpful, but not necessarily the fact that there's certain beliefs that are likely to lead to guilt. Mm. And that's why, again, in the book, having this checklist of criteria you're looking for, and then we have you look to see, did I do criteria one, criteria two? So like Ray's saying, yeah, I think that probably would have been helpful therapeutically to connect the emotion with the behavior. But for this skill that we're trying to treat or trying to teach, we want to highlight the belief, which then can lead to the emotion and that valid after the behavior. What you're doing is excellent, good validation, probably just need more work going back. This is where the practice comes in. More work from going back towards teaching the VC connection. Here's another one. So you're telling yourself that you're a bad person because of this, and this is leading you to feel overwhelmed by guilt. I like that. Okay. In other words, this is what your self-talk is. This is the resulting emotion that you have. So that was really very good and succinct. In other words, uh, you don't have to say a whole lot to get to that point. Mm. And, you know, uh, sometimes I think that good psychotherapy is really a dialogue. And if we have too long of a response, which we're likely to do, especially when we're teaching a seminar here, we uh, don't do it. So that was succinct. I liked it. But okay. the difference between doing it through this model, if we were in a room together or online together, and then and each one of you makes a response, and we would have you go back and practice it again. So if we're going to have, okay, so now, great. You identify the emotion. You identify the behavior. Let's make sure we teach the V component. Let's go back and do it again. And so we repeatedly work. This is the premise of deliberate practice to build competence and expertise is we repeatedly give feedback to build these skills to the point where you're able to look at subsequent examples and check them off that you're doing the, you're doing the, the skill in its entirety too. Great. Here's another. Okay. It sounds like you think you should have called your mother on her birthday and didn't. And now you think you're a bad person and feel guilty. So yeah, that I like, because that's got both beliefs in it. Should yes. have, I'm a bad person. And then you also have the guilt component. So I think that's, that's teaching the skills. The one part it didn't do, the second skill, does that sound right? Uh, and do I, does this make sense to you? Do you understand that? That's the, the second criterion that we had about understanding the BC connection. I like that. My only other suggestion would be you can also pull in the behavioral consequence. You feel guilty and as a result, buy an expensive gift that you could not have bought. And again, if we were in a room together and say, all right, go back, do all that again. Just add the behavioral consequence to, to help build these skills too. And I think what, what that last comment did was end with a question, because when we reflect, we may be wrong, and it's good to let clients know that we're going to listen to them and that they're the expert on them. We also want to check our thinking and get feedback. So the client is the expert on themselves. We may have a hypothesis. Here's our hypothesis. Let us know what you think. That goes a long way to building a good alliance. So something I'd like to highlight here is we talked about how these are, quote unquote, basic REBT skills, uh, but we're seeing that there is a lot of subtlety and nuance. And there's a lot of because I the responses we're getting suggest that many of the participants have some training, at least in REBT, that the, these are not total novices. And this is what we've seen with deliver practice is even people with considerable experience can often gain something by going back and rehearsing basic exercises. Would would you agree, Mark and Ray? Yes, I think that that's true. I think sometimes when you 
drift away from your earlier training. You develop some bad habits. You take shortcuts. You know, you don't always follow through. And uh, I kind of call that, you know, that we're, we all can be drifters. Mm-hmm. I think given what we do, you know, Mark and I are less likely to drift. But I think that if you're not training people and thinking about making, it's easier to say what's quicker and not do the skill that accounted for your success earlier in your career. And I, and I think too, building off of that, getting the opportunity to practice different skills too is really important here. Like, so, you know, I know for me, the functional dispute is probably my go-to dispute with most clients. Though. How is thinking this way helping you? How is thinking this way helping you move towards your goals? That's my go-to. But if I don't practice the other ones, on the days that the functional dispute, for whatever reason, is not working with a specific client, even if I'm executing it perfect, I need to have other approaches to help them challenge their beliefs. And so I think that the nuance part is having the knowledge, having the experience, the practice, and getting feedback on how we do those things, too. Yeah, something I'd like to remind all the participants is uh, for every exercise in the book, uh, there are uh, 15 example responses. Uh, and so you can uh, kind of see what what are some uh, uh, really highly effective way of responding. Um, I, I think we have to start uh, wrapping up uh today we've we've got a lot of, we've had really great uh participation by all the attendees so thank you very much for trying these exercises uh mark and ray do you have any uh parting thoughts you'd like to leave us with well i just see a comment that came up here by uh, hank rob that even really skilled uh, singers musicians ball players they practice every day you know i have a friend who's uh, plays the cello in an orchestra Boy, does she rehearse all the time. And so maybe we get the idea that because we've been doing this for so many years, we don't need to practice, but it's easy to get out of practice. So I think that's really an important thing. You really want to watch your own behavior and make sure you practice it and do it the right way, regardless of the degree of skill that you think you have. Yeah. And one of the things, too, is we use this in training with our beginning clinicians but also more senior colleagues who've been doing RBT for many years have given feedback about the book, how helpful the book was in making them rethink some of the ways they communicate. So we, we always should be evolving. We always should be learning. Uh, my, my belief is deliver practice is an excellent way to build those skills within RBT. I should also mention, by the way, that it's a great opportunity to practice some unconditional self-acceptance as you're practicing this and remind ourselves we are all very fallible because we need to tolerate a lot of mistakes as you're doing deliberate practice. It is much harder to tolerate that than just reading RBT books. Right. I think that is a key aspect of the theory, unconditional self-acceptance, and it may be the hardest thing for us to practice and anywhere where we can make mistakes publicly gives us an opportunity to practice that. Yeah. So, and, and Alex and Tony, I'm just putting them in the in the chat box. My email address. That if people have further questions right. afterwards, they can certainly email about REBT and about deliberate practice. They certainly can do that. Great. I'm gonna put the link to buy the book again. And I put my email as well. Uh, And I'd like to say uh, thank you again to Mark and Ray for joining us and for producing such a remarkable book. uh, We keep hearing a really positive uh, uh, feedback on the book. And uh, for all the participants who uh, joined us today and engaged in the chat, we we had dozens of responses uh, to the example, um, to the example, uh, statements. So, and thank you to APA for hosting us. We really yes. appreciate it. And thank you all for coming out. We appreciate yes. you have valuable things to do with your time. Thank you for listening. Especially yes. those who joined us in the middle of the night from uh, yes. the Middle East and uh, the Pacific and all over. Yeah, and all over. So uh, that's really wonderful. Yeah. Thank you all. Well, thank you guys again. Hmm. Take care.